there, I'm Lloyd Evans, and you join me from an undisclosed location somewhere in Istria, Croatia, where I have fled to with my family due to an earthquake or series of earthquakes that have been afflicting the area where the bunker is. Uh, just before we fled to where we are now, one of the videos I was planning to make was a review of the very worst Jehovah's Witness videos of 2020. I might as well do it now. <laughs> so without further ado, here is my choice. We're going to count down from 10 to 1. And here is my choice for number 10. But mum, listen. No Jade, you listen. Isn't this just another of your phases? It's time to move on, love. The holidays are our time. It's all I get from you. Promise me you'll be here. <laughs> Promise. I really don't want to disappoint her, but I can't disappoint Jehovah. Of course. You love them both. Don't you think he can help you? Talk to him. I spent a long time pouring out my heart to him. And I remembered something from one of the Psalms. I will walk in your truth, unify my heart to fear your name. Yes, the Jade and Nita dramatizations were unquestionably one of the worst aspects of the 2020 Always Rejoice convention. When they started, I assumed it was just going to be a fairly short series demonstrating how to do a Bible study in an effective way. That's, I suppose, what the intent was, but it ended up being a much longer series, 14 segments or 14 parts to it, that were really a guide on how to indoctrinate someone, how to use mind control techniques to hijack someone's thinking and make them believe things that they ordinarily would reject as absurd. I actually made or I turned my rebuttals to the Jade and Nita dramatizations into a single video, the story of Jade and Nita, how to turn someone into a Jehovah's Witness in 14 steps. Presumably many of you will be familiar with that video. If you haven't seen this already, it's worth checking out because these dramatizations were effectively the governing body proudly saying to Jehovah's Witnesses, we expect you to deceive people. We expect you to trick people into thinking that their ideas matter, that their questions matter, that they are friends of yours. We expect you to do tasks for them and do free labor for them as a means of enticing them into the group. Of course, you're supposed to drop them like a ton of bricks if they ever stop believing. 
but pretend that we're this loving organization that will do absolutely anything for someone. So really disturbing series of videos which make it to number 10 on the list. We're now going to look at number nine. Are you confused by the number of JW apps in the mobile app store? Maybe a brother or sister has shown you an app saying it works great. Some seem to be designed for Jehovah's Witnesses, but are not provided by the faithful and discreet slave. What dangers are there with unauthorized apps for mobile devices? First, it's very important to know the source of the information it provides. It is also important to ensure that it comes from the faithful and discreet slave. Some unauthorized apps may include low-quality information that is only partially correct. Remember, if it's just 10% correct, it is 100% misleading. Other apps may even be written by those who intentionally promote false information with a malicious intent. The authors of these apps can be like the bird catchers that the prophet Jeremiah described as setting a deadly trap. Their information can be spiritually damaging. What about internet websites that are not sponsored by the faithful and discreet slave? It's important to remember, anyone can put anything on the internet. Some websites and social media websites that claim to be for Jehovah's Witnesses may also provide information that is misleading. What we read can even expose us to apostate ideas. A website may also ask for personal information. This can put your privacy or personal identity at risk. How can you know if an app or website is from the faithful and discreet slave? Ask yourself, have I seen this app or website mentioned in our publications? Has the governing body specifically recommended that we use it? Electronic tools like JW Library and JW.org are powerful and accomplish good. As we use them, our appreciation grows for the healthy spiritual food they give us. Use them freely while being very cautious about other mobile apps or websites. Follow the advice at 1 Thessalonians 5.21 to make sure of all things, especially making sure that any mobile apps or websites we use are the genuine article, spiritual food from the faithful and discreet slave. Now that I'm watching it, I'm not sure whether this video belongs in a list of 10 worst as much as it belongs in a list of 10 funniest because <laughs> looking back on it now, and it's hard to believe this video was put out there in 2020. I say put out there, it hasn't been fully released, you could say, which I will get to, but it's hard to believe uh, that this happened in 2020, this monstrosity of a video, the purpose of which was to terrify witnesses into thinking that any website or app about their religion that doesn't come from the faithful slave, from the governing body, should be avoided at all costs because it's somehow radioactive and originates from the bird catcher. Yes, apostates are bird catchers who are just as evil as people who would catch birds in cages and make them wither and die in there. Just outrageous. And for me, one of the, well, it was funny and it was also infuriating, the hypocrisy of all this, because we get that slogan if it's 10% wrong. If it's only 10% wrong, it's 100% misleading. And as I argued in my rebuttal, which I would urge you to watch if you've not seen it already, there's a long line of Watchtower publications or examples in Watchtower publications showing the organization outright lying to Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'm not just talking about the long line of failed predictions for the end of the world for Armageddon. I'm talking about where they have made factual statements that are fundamentally incorrect. This is an organization that is prolific when it comes to lying to its followers 
And yet they routinely turn around to people like me, to apostates, and accuse us of lying. And it's interesting because this is actually a classic tactic of a narcissist. A narcissist will always accuse his or her victim of doing the very thing that they're doing. And that's exactly what we see the organization doing. Same as with the data collection. <laughs> they accuse apostates like me of harvesting people's data for nefarious purposes. I don't harvest anyone's data. If anyone is guilty when it comes to harvesting people's data without their permission or being sluggish in turning over the data when someone requests it, it's undoubtedly the Jehovah's Witness organization. They even have, as I mentioned in the video, this publisher ID system where if you want to make spiritual progress within the religion, if you want to be a delegate to international conventions, if you want to be a ministerial servant, if you want to be a pioneer, if you want to be an elder, you have to give permission for them to store your information digitally. And bear in mind, this is an organization that says your very survival of Armageddon depends on you doing the very best you can in service to God. So <laughs> just multiple layers of hypocrisy in this video. And what's most fascinating is that as of now, and I've just done a quick check on JW.org, I could be mistaken. It could be that it's on JW.org. They've just made it very hard to find but I think it's fairly safe to say that this video isn't available for ordinary members of the public to watch. You can't go on jw.org, type in the word apostate and have this video come up in the search results. Watchtower has shown this video to Jehovah's Witnesses at the congregation meetings, their target audience, if you like, but for reasons best known to them, they're afraid to show it to ordinary people. I think I can guess why. I think even they realize just how culty the organization will appear to someone who watches this video who isn't under the thrall of the faithful slave. So that was my selection for number nine. We now move to number eight misinformation about Jehovah's organization and the governing body. Jehovah's Witnesses have been accused of promoting communism, while others claim that we promote the ideals and interests of American imperialism. Our brothers and sisters have been called anarchists, and nowadays we are being called extremists, and the list can go on. What will be the next lie? Remember, lies create doubts and destroy trust. Some of what we can hear and read is based on misinformation campaigns of apostates. It may sound convincing, even to us. Even if we now say, I will not believe it anyway, I'm just curious to know what it is. Exposing ourselves to this kind of misinformation can create doubt, doubts and undermine our complete trust in the governing body. This makes us vulnerable. Jehovah will use his organization to lead us to, through the great tribulation. There is just no other way to succeed. And when it comes to news about Jehovah's organization, we can expect more lies to be spread as we get closer to Jehovah's day. Let us therefore strengthen our trust today. The good guidance from Jehovah's organization during this pandemic is just another proof that Jehovah is with the governing body. Therefore, let us limit our exposure to these lies and strengthen our trust in Jehovah and his organization today. This will prepare us for one of the greatest lies in the very near future. Peace and security. And remember, this will be fake news and many most people will believe in it. Interesting there that Gaius Glockentine was 
using the phrase fake news. We all know of a politician or political character who used that slogan quite a lot to silence any negative media about him. But yes, this was very much along the lines of what we saw previously with that bird catcher video. Again, keeping Jehovah's Witnesses in a perpetual state of fear and distrust when it comes to any information that might be critical of the organization, even to the point where Gaius Gluckentin was using the straw man fallacy. He was picking a criticism of the organization that doesn't really exist. I mean, I'm sure people have said it or governments have said, uh, oh yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses are communists. I think I found an example in my original rebuttal video to this of where they said that back in the 40s or 50s or whatever it was. <laughs> but he was picking an example from the distant past. And obviously with straw man fallacies, the whole point is to construct an argument or construct a counter argument to your position that like a straw man is easily dismantled. That's what he was doing here. He was picking a weak argument that isn't really made by apostates and using that to say, hey, look how ridiculous these arguments are from critics of our organization. Of course, we would never be communists or of course, we would never be imperialists. So very disingenuous of Gaius Glockentine. He seems to be quite the con artist, quite the spin doctor for the organization. It's going to be interesting to see how he is deployed in 2021. But yes, this was just blatant propaganda. And we see another example of this sort of rhetoric in my selection for number seven. Well, today, wicked men and imposters use exactly the same techniques, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, they use lies and misrepresentation. They lie about how we deal with child abusers, how we care for the victims of child abuse. They twist statements that are made uh, regarding our stand on blood, loyalty to families, disfellowshipping. They capitalize on what they perceive as errors, perhaps dogmatic statements we made in the past regarding a Bible prophecy or, or understanding of the time of the end, and then we later changed it. They also put a negative spin on changes that they do not understand. See, why we simplified, did reassignments in 2015, and new explanations of the generation, changes at world headquarters. What's the result? Well, some are swayed by these things. They're stumbled, they're knocked down. It's too heavy for them to carry. How about us? How strong is our spiritual core? See, that's why we hear repeatedly that we must personally have a regular, deep study of the scriptures. That's why we're right, reminded repeatedly that Jehovah is using the governing body to give us the good things that we have. Now, why is that so important? Well, because one day we may hit a time, whether personally in our personal life or as an organization, when all the other spiritual peripherals are gone, all the extras. What do we do then? Uh, what do we do, for example, if the lights go out on broadcasting? Uh, what happens perhaps when we, we don't have the incredible conventions, the uh, touching videos, the catchy music, the beautifully written, well-written Watchtower articles, the exciting annual meetings? They're gone. See, some of our brothers and sisters do not have access to those things right now. We see at that time, it will come down to our faith that this is God's word, and the governing body is the channel that Jehovah has been using. Now that I'm watching this video, I'm thinking maybe this should be video number eight and Gaius Glockentin should have been video number seven because in a way, Robert Lucioni's video here is better because at least he's being a little bit more honest than Gaius Glockentin was. I was explaining how Gaius employed the straw man fallacy. Well, here, Robert Lucioni, he's kind of mentioning, 
he's at least mentioning the criticisms of the organization. He's at least mentioning the fact that the mishandling of child abuse is something that critics of the organization are highlighting. Sure, he's glossing over these things. It was fascinating to see him just casually mention, oh yeah, we've printed or said dogmatic things in the past, and then we've later gone and changed our minds. So what? It, he was glossing over or trivializing these things, but at least he was mentioning them. At least there was something there for a thinking witness who might be starting to wake up to think, hmm, I wonder if that's worth looking into a little bit more. Of course, that wasn't the intent. The intent wasn't to encourage witnesses to go away and do their own objective research into their beliefs. Instead, this is very much a thought-stopping speech, just as Gaius Glockentin's speech was thought-stopping. The difference being that Robert Lucioni is flat out accusing critics like me of being wicked men and imposters. So whereas Gaius Glockentin was merely accusing people like me of lying or people who leave the organization of lying, in the context of the theme that Robert Lucioni was working with and how he's developing his points, he's accusing me or anyone really who leaves the organization and speaks out about it, including victims of abuse, He's accusing these of being wicked. And yet here he is being a spokesperson or acting like a spokesperson for an organization that covers up abuse on an industrial scale and puts children in harm's way by refusing to allow predators to meet justice. And he has the gall to accuse people like me of wickedness. So I guess that's why his video made it slightly higher in the list. Anyway, we move away from video or selection number seven and we move on to selection number six. Think about it. Young children have a tendency to eat what they like regardless of its nutritional value. Most young ones would be perfectly happy eating ice cream, candy, cookies, and other sweets for all of their meals. Think about it. The vast majority of the waking hours of a small child are spent playing. Play, play, and more play. Most of their life is fun and games. But later, when the child goes to school, where does he get the time to do so. He has to take it from his playtime. But now, spiritually speaking, we can ask ourselves, how far have we progressed in buying out time from our playtime? If we had time, we could have discussed other negative traits to be avoided, such as children tend to have a short attention span. They're easily distracted. Their curiosity often gets them into trouble, and they generally need a lot of time and attention. They're high maintenance. We might mention that we've had just a few parents write in expressing concern that some of our videos depict scenes that could have an effect on children who've been protected from anything even hinting at an act of violence. We very much appreciate the concern. We don't feel comfortable watering down the inspired insight that Jehovah has preserved for the benefit of true worshipers. However, as you've observed, we do so as tastefully as possible. We don't show actual violent acts or bloodshed. Parents, likewise, need to give their children a realistic idea of what we all will face in the near future. Be assured that we'll continue to be sensitive to the feelings of you parents 
when we produce a video that's based on a Bible account that includes descriptions of warfare or other incidents of violent actions. This was an absolutely fascinating JW Broadcasting episode. I didn't realize at the time that I did my rebuttal just how much interest there would be in it. And in context, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm now starting to form opinions or hypotheses as to why that might be. But let me just say, I obviously keep an eye on the stats for the channel. So the February 2020 broadcast, I've so far had 43,000 views, 42,000 views for March, 45,000 views for April. We've just been watching some clips from the May 2020 broadcast, 73,000. So almost double uh, the normal viewership for my rebuttal to the May 2020. And then immediately afterwards, it went right back down to 35,000 for September, 39,000 for October and so on. So immense interest in this particular JW Broadcasting episode. And I think it's obvious, again, with hindsight, when we see those clips that we've just seen, why there might have been a spike. It seems as though the governing body is getting so extreme and so crazy with its fanaticism and the extent to which it demands indoctrination, even of children, that it's even starting to upset believing Jehovah's Witness parents. Obviously, those of you who saw my December 2020 JW Broadcasting rebuttal will know that this issue hasn't gone away. Stephen Lett utterly failed in trying to placate parents by essentially telling them, we know better. We take on board your concerns, but actually, screw you. <laughs> we know what's best for your children. We don't care whether our propaganda showing biblical violence is age appropriate or not. Your children need a realistic idea of what's coming for them if they fail to recognize our authority. Surprisingly, <laughs> that approach doesn't seem to have worked to the point where, again, in the December 2020 JW Broadcasting episode, Tony Morris has to essentially repeat the exact same statement. I mean, obviously it wasn't verbatim, but he was essentially telling parents the same thing we know better, we know you've been writing in, we know you don't like the Hezekiah video, we know you don't like the bunker videos, just deal with it. Because we've decided that your children should be forced, forced to watch this material at our conventions. And as I've said before, for those of you who don't know too much about how this works, there's a difference between just ordinary videos that get put up on JW.org, such as the JW Broadcasting episodes. I mean, to a degree, I can imagine parents being given some kind of latitude when it comes to what they show their children. I would imagine most parents will be expected to show their children JW Broadcasting episodes, but even then, if it's a very young child, I don't think it will be demanded that the young child sit through an entire JW Broadcasting episode, it's different with conventions. Because at conventions, everyone has to sit through everything. No matter how young they are, you turn up for the convention with your badge card. And in 2020, it was done virtually, but it worked essentially the same way. You show up, you turn on your device, and you watch the whole thing, including your children, if you have children, there's no opt-out. There's no saying, mm, actually, I, I kind of don't want Jimmy to see this. Jimmy has to see this.
because the governing body, specifically the teaching committee of the governing body, who I might add, consists of only one parent, and that parent is Tony Morris. So the one parent on the teaching committee almost certainly has PTSD from his Vietnam days and a very warped sense of what is or isn't appropriate for children. Everyone else on the teaching committee, including Stephen Lett, doesn't really have any experience with children and aren't, frankly, in a position to say to parents, we know better than you. And what's interesting is we saw that other footage of Stephen Lett giving a talk where he was telling witnesses that they should be childlike, not childish. And in essence, what he was saying was, we just want you to avoid all of the childlike attributes that kind of irritate me, Stephen Lett, personally. And then he is able to list this long line of things that get under his skin, including the fact that children are high maintenance. <laughs> Stephen Lett resents the fact that children need to be cared for. How dare you, children? <laughs> How dare you need to be looked after? How dare you require time and attention? He's received time and attention, we assume, when he was a child, but he resents the fact that ordinary children receive this time and attention and that they're nurtured by their parents and that this takes their parents away from theocratic activities. He resents the high maintenance he even resents the fact that children play. And we know that play is a fundamental part of a child's development. Without play, a child is going to be seriously messed up in their development. And yet Stephen Lett thinks that play is a negative thing, which demonstrates how little he understands children. And yet look at his position in the organization. Look at the influence he has in shaping young minds through his role on the teaching committee, which includes the crafting of propaganda cartoons like the Caleb and Sophia series. This is the sort of individual who's behind all that. Is it any wonder that this organization can't begin to have a clue about what is or isn't age appropriate when one of the leading individuals who's influencing all of this stuff just doesn't have the first clue about children and quite evidently despises them. But anyway, that's all I have to say on selection number six. We move on to selection number five and we're staying with Stephen Lett. Please let me share some thoughts with you. The spread of this disease is distressing, to be sure. But we're really not uh, surprised to see the world in the grip of such pestilence, are we? Jesus made it clear at Luke 21, 11, that pestilence would be part of a sign of the last days. And in Revelation chapter 6, the ride of the fourth horseman includes mention of deadly plague. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. These are words that I'm sure will come back to haunt Stephen Lett. If not Stephen Lett, then certainly the organization. History will not be kind when people in the future watch this video, which I'm sure at some point will end up being branded old light or something that only apostates might watch. But history will not be kind when 
decades or centuries from now, we look back at the way this particular religion reacted to the coronavirus pandemic and leapt on the opportunity to exploit it as a means of control, as a means of fear-mongering, an opportunity to terrify eight and a half million followers into thinking the end's here. This is the final part of the final part of the last days of the last days, or however it was he put it. Absolutely shocking exploitation of a catastrophe that has gone on so far to take seven and a half thousand Jehovah's Witness lives. And let's remember, I haven't included it in the list, but it deserves an honorary mention. Let's remember that Anthony Morris's first reaction or early reaction regarding the coronavirus. What, what we're experiencing right now in this uh, global pandemic, I was telling the branch class yesterday, uh, it doesn't bother me. We've been waiting for this. We knew things like this were going to happen. Christ Jesus has prepared us. Where's the shock? something that went on to cause the deaths of thousands of his followers apparently didn't bother Tony Morris. How charming. And something that as of now, January 2021, is closing in on taking 2 million lives worldwide. 2 million lives snuffed out due to this pandemic. And when it first surfaced towards the beginning of 2020, the governing body were there rubbing their hands, saying, brilliant. Here's something we can exploit. Here's something that we can use to say, ah, the end is here. You'd better join our organization. Or if you've recently left or fallen inactive, now is the time to come running back. I've put it so high on the list because this organization fundamentally failed the test of reacting to a tragedy in a mature and reasonable and appropriate way. Instead of appreciating that mental health is a crucial ingredient when it comes to weathering a calamity such as this and scare tactics, there's no room for them when we're dealing with pandemics of this kind. They just went barreling forth and invoking apocalyptic doomsday ideology and narratives at the worst possible time. Again, history will not be kind when future generations look back on this particular clip. But we move on in our list, leaving behind selection five, we move to selection four. First, you know, there are times when compassion should not be shown. For example, if someone deliberately persists in sin, it would be wrong to feel that we should compassionately shield them from discipline. See, that would be misplaced compassion. Let's notice an example in ancient Israel. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy 13, if you look in verse 6, the Israelites were commanded that if a brother, child, well, you notice there are some expressions such as cherished wife or closest companion. If any of those were to urge a person to serve other gods, notice the instruction in verse 8. You must not give in to him or listen to him, nor should you show pity or feel compassion or protect him. Instead, you should kill him without fail. Now, why was that so important? Why was it important not to show compassion? Well, verse 11, then all Israel will hear and become afraid and they will never again do anything bad like this among you. So it was for a protection for the nation. If someone tried to turn an Israelite from serving Jehovah, that was not the time to show compassion. Yielding to pressure to show compassion when it's contrary to God's will can have serious consequences. So we certainly need to avoid misplaced compassion. So while the moral climate has killed compassion in the hearts of so many today, we want to be known for our compassion. 
Of course, never would we want to display misplaced compassion if someone deliberately persists in sin. Rather, we want to imitate Jehovah and kindly act on our feelings of compassion for those in need. So as we go about our day, let's look for ways that we can heed the admonition there at Ephesians 4.32, become kind to one another, tenderly compassionate. I'm reacting to this video for the first time because this was actually uploaded to JW.org over the Christmas period. Here we are in January 2021 and I finally have time to sit down and reflect on the fanatical extremist diatribe that we've just been listening to here is a governing body helper leonard myers inciting hatred against anyone who leaves the organization or anyone who suggests that it might be a good idea to leave the organization and you can imagine how this feels for me <laughs> as someone who has been accused of being a hate speech enthusiast by CCJW, by Jehovah's Witnesses in 2020, I obviously have my hate speech series in which I'm going through methodically all of the various examples that they've given of me being hateful. Well, what about this? What about a governing body member invoking a text from Deuteronomy that says anyone who tries to dissuade us from our religion should be slaughtered. How is that not hate speech? How is that not inciting violence towards those who see things differently or have different religious views? And let's just be realistic for a moment. I don't expect any Jehovah's Witnesses will be picking up their swords or rushing to the gun shop to buy weapons so that they can go around in a violent frenzy mowing down apostates. We all know, realistically, that's not going to happen. I think we need to have some context here. Nevertheless, how is this not hate speech? And when we're talking about an organisation that has perfected the art of killing someone without killing them. In other words, shunning them and treating them as though they don't exist, which for many victims of shunning ends up becoming a reason why they can no longer continue with their lives. There are so many examples anecdotally of where that sort of treatment has had the effect of ending someone's life because we're social creatures. We're not designed to deal with having people we care about turn their backs on us. We're just not designed to cope with it. And this sort of dehumanizing, vile, hateful rhetoric coming from the faithful slave, coming from a governing body helper, obviously isn't going to help. If anything, it's going to make Jehovah's Witnesses feel justified in perpetuating this vile shunning policy. But I'm afraid we're not done with hateful rhetoric. Coming up next in selection number three is arguably the master of hateful rhetoric when it comes to Jehovah's Witness propaganda, it's Tony Morris. As this Jewish scholar suggests, Gehenna was used for the disposal of refuse and carcasses of those deemed unworthy of burial. Fire would be a suitable means of eliminating such refuse. Now this point, what the fire did not consume, the maggots would. Now, I don't know if you know much about maggots, but uh, you see a whole bunch of them. It's just not a pleasant sight. But what a fitting picture of the final end of all of God's enemies. Sobering, yet something we look forward to. However, the apostates and the enemies of Jehovah would say, well, that's gruesome, that's despicable. You teach your people these things, 
No, God teaches his people these things. This is what he's foretelling. And frankly, for friends of Jehovah God, how reassuring that they're finally going to be gone. All these despicable enemies that have just reproached Jehovah's name, destroyed, never, ever to live again. Now, it's not that we rejoice in someone's death, but when it comes to God's enemies, finally. They're out of the way, especially these despicable apostates who at one point had dedicated their life to God and then they joined forces with Satan, the devil, the chief apostate of, of all time. Just to emphasize this, but the wicked will perish. The enemies of Jehovah will vanish like glorious pastures. Particularly, they will vanish like smoke. So this, I thought this would be a nice memory aid, this verse stay in the mind, here's what Jehovah's promising. Okay. <laughs> That's Jehovah's enemies. They're going to vanish like smoke. Well, that could have gone very differently. Tony Morris needs to be careful there <laughs> when it comes to subjecting a naked flame to his breath. <laughs> but yes, wow, 2020 served up a real doozy there. Tony Morris just unleashing all of his hatred of apostates, all of his indignation at those who don't accept his authority. He's relishing their destruction to the point of going into quite some detail over verses that describe bodies decomposing with maggots and so forth, and singling out apostates, not just saying, oh, people who oppose God, but making the point of saying, especially, especially these apostates, especially these individuals who criticize me, who hold me accountable, who allow people to see through my lies and my bluster and my manipulation. How dare they? I can't wait for them to be maggot food. That's what he's saying very openly and brazenly in this video. And then he does that little stunt at the end where he blows out the match. And of course, the context is that he believes he's going to be the one quite literally snuffing out the lives of people who disagree with him because Jehovah's Witnesses believe, or the governing body certainly teach, that they will be raptured, I guess, to heaven just before Armageddon so that they can participate in the slaughter. So when someone like Tony Morris is warning people, you need to be careful because Armageddon's coming and those who disagree with my authority, they're going to die. He's not just saying you're going to die. He's effectively saying in the context of what he's teaching, I'm coming for you. I'm going to be one of the ones on my heavenly horse. <laughs> Clutching my heavenly bottle of Macallans, I'm going to hunt you down and I'm going to finish you off if you don't acknowledge my authority in the here and now. What a vile man and uh, good in a way that he was showing how vile he is in full HD for everyone to see, which he did in 2020. And this brings us to the final two items on my list. Let's take a look at item number two. We don't wanna see this disfellowshipping arrangement simply as some cold disciplinary action, a threat that tries to motivate people, well, we'll be good or we're going to kick you out. No, it's an arrangement that's based on love. One, it's love for Jehovah, for his name, for his clean standards. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on in the part. But two, it's love for the individual wrongdoer. I like how it mentions at the end of verse five, when it says, nor give up when you are corrected by him. 
if it was not out of love, then a person would not be able to get back up and regain their relationship with him. Very nice. Thank you. And now, even though it is a theocratic arrangement and it is an arrangement based in love, it doesn't mean that there are no challenges or emotional pain involved, especially when a close relative stops serving Jehovah. Well, now in the following video, uh, this video is going to highlight the challenges, but also the reason why it's important to loyally support this arrangement. And let's watch the video entitled, Maintain Loyalty with a Unified Heart. My name is Gabriella. Ben and I have always enjoyed attending the meetings. But lately, it's been difficult. Something was missing. Our son. And here's where we want to take a moment and talk to you parents out there especially you moms, uh, when a child leaves the truth, leaves serving Jehovah, it does no good to blame yourself or try to second guess every decision, wondering if you could have done something different or better. You create an environment for them to make the best decision possible. And once you've done that, the child carries the responsibility for their own decision. But that doesn't mean that there are no, no negative feelings, but here's where the congregation can help out. In our second question, uh, how can the congregation support the faithful family members? We can perhaps try and uh, fill the role that was lost by the disfellowship one. Maybe we can be their spiritual son or daughter or spiritual mother uh, or father or sister or brother. Really just uh, spending time with them can, can help as well. Very nice practical suggestions. It's not often that a video makes it into my worst of for a given year that isn't presented by a governing body member or a governing body helper. It's just being presented by seemingly an ordinary elder, but this was an official Jehovah's Witness video. You won't find it on their website. This was made available via, I think, JW Stream. It's essentially a model meeting that was put out for a meeting item that was reinforcing the shunning policy and reminding Jehovah's Witnesses of the need to shun disfellowshipped sons or daughters, fathers or mothers, cousins, nieces, nephews, no matter how close the bond, you're to cut them off. You're to treat them as though they're dead. There was an entire meeting item reinforcing the need to do this as a show of love. Because apparently it's loving to treat people as though they're dead because they've fallen short in, in some way or, heaven forbid... <laughs> they've stopped believing as you do. What made this talk especially bad, and again, what we've just seen won't have been seen by all Jehovah's Witnesses. It will probably only have been seen by a very small percentage of Jehovah's Witnesses who needed to watch this model meeting. But the meeting part was for all Jehovah's Witnesses to follow along with. So it might not have been Brother Waddington, <laughs> our kind of holographic elder character who was completely emotionless and completely heartless, it seems. It might not have been Brother Waddington presenting this information. It would have been whatever elder was taking that particular meeting part for your congregation. All Jehovah's Witnesses will have had this meeting part and all Jehovah's Witnesses were made to watch the 2016 video dramatization Maintain Loyalty with a Unified Heart, which I've spoken about before on the channel. It's one of the very worst propaganda videos that Jehovah's Witnesses have ever made. But 
eight and a half million Jehovah's Witnesses were made to sit down and watch it and answer questions about it. So it was required viewing. It wasn't just something where people could decide for themselves. Do I want to watch a video that talks about how great disfellowshipping is and how a mother ought to disown her son and treat him like he's dead? No, all Jehovah's Witnesses were forced to sit through this vile piece of propaganda and then answer questions and you get questions like, what role can the congregation play? How can the congregation help? And you had this individual commenting, oh, well, the congregation can take the place of the family member who's being disfellowshipped. If it's the son who's disfellowshipped, we can become the spiritual son. Or a sister in the congregation, she can become the spiritual daughter. We'll take their place. No problem. Problem solved. We'll just replace that individual. Just a shocking approach. I mean, what do relationships even mean if you can just replace someone like that? This is an organisation where people gradually forget what relationships even are in the context of the need for loyalty in the context of the need to put the organization above everything else, including the love you have for your child or for your family member. Absolutely disgusting. And in this particular video, which we managed to get hold of, and I obviously did a full rebuttal to it on my channel, check it out if you haven't done so before, it gave us a glimpse into the extent of indoctrination that Jehovah's Witnesses are receiving on this issue in their congregation meetings. But it's time to move to the final item on our list. And who better to return to than governing body member Stephen Lett. There'll be many others who will come back who will have to abandon their former way of life. I was thinking, as an example, a homosexual. Now, this former homosexual comes back in the resurrection, and he really thought, and he, he was taught, and he came to believe that God accepted him with that lifestyle. But now he's going to learn about Jehovah's moral standards. And he's going to learn that Jehovah will not lower his standard to accommodate us. We have to come up to Jehovah's standard. Will he change? Will he adjust? It'll be up to him. But you brothers and sisters will help such ones to enjoy life eternal. All must learn to walk in Jehovah's righteous ways and willingly choose to do so. But now what if someone refuses to make the necessary changes? Well, the Watchtower commented on that. It said, after being given ample time, maybe even a hundred years, to seek God, some will show that they refuse to practice righteousness. Justly, they will lose life in the new world. As we can see from Isaiah 65, verse 12, which says, And the sinner will be cursed, even though he is a hundred years of age. But we expect this will be the minority that the majority will be delighted to make the adjustments so they can live in that wonderful new world. Don't worry, it's just going to be the minority who gets slaughtered over their sexuality. And we don't need to worry about minorities, do we? <laughs> Not that we're being hateful towards a minority. We would never spew hate speech towards a minority it's just that some minorities deserve to lose life because of who they are. <laughs> Again, this was the year in which they accused me of hate speech. And here's a governing body member saying, if you're gay, you deserve to lose life. Now, hopefully by the time 
this particular video of mine airs, you will have seen my interview with Stephen Lett's niece, Brandy, where we get some context to this. It was bad enough when we saw this video as part of the Always Rejoice 2020 Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. They did the convention differently rather than having the convention in actual venues where Jehovah's Witnesses would turn up. Governing body members and governing body helpers recorded their items towards the end of April, which is what Stephen Lett's doing here. It was bad enough at the time, and I made a, a video specifically on this particular subject because it showcases in full HD the intolerance of this organization and the way they dehumanize gay people and people from the LGBTQ plus community. This is what people are up against who have the wrong sexuality, according to Stephen Lett. But in my interview with Brandy, which I would encourage you to watch if you've not seen this already, we learned more of the background to this. Now, it's possible that Stephen Lett gave this talk without having his nephew in mind. But it's also very likely that he did have his nephew in mind. His nephew, only in January 2020, ending his life because he couldn't handle the way he was being treated as someone raised a Jehovah's Witness who was gay. And is it any wonder when you have material like this? I've put this at number one, not just because I'm some lefty, <laughs> not just because I'm ultra progressive and wanting to look trendy and that kind of thing. No, come on, we need to take a stand here. This sort of vile, hateful rhetoric has a body count attached. There will be more Stevens, and I, when I say Stephen, I mean Brandy's brother who died. There will be more Stevens, arguably, as a direct result of what we've just heard Stephen let's say here. Because just think of the gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, Jehovah's Witness children who are being forced to sit through this with their parents at their side and who are being told by their religious leaders, you'd better shape up. You'd better get rid of your sexual orientation or you deserve to lose life. You deserve to be slaughtered. But don't worry, you're a, you're a minority. We can get rid of minorities. We don't have to have a conscience about minorities. They can be extinguished as long as the majority is okay. What astonishing rhetoric. But this also introduced the bizarre idea that someone who is gay, having died before Armageddon, because when they talk about the resurrection, they're talking about people who haven't been judged at Armageddon. They've died before Armageddon has come. People including the likes of Stephen's nephew, Stephen. I know it's confusing, but his nephew who ended his life was called Stephen. When Stephen Lett is giving this hypothetical scenario, he will at the very least have people like his nephew in mind who die before Armageddon as gay people. And Stephen Lett is here saying they'll be dragged back into life by a God who has killed them because apparently the wages of the wages that sin pays is death. Once you've died, you've been acquitted of all your sins, but apparently God's going to drag people back into the new world as gay people if they died as gay people. Gay people who die before Armageddon will be dragged back with this same issue that afflicted them if they were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, and they'll effectively have to start all over again with suppressing their sexuality. 
oh, you get a hundred years, apparently. You get a hundred years to get rid of your gayness. It, honestly, again, this will have a body count attached. There will be Jehovah's Witnesses watching this, especially younger Jehovah's Witnesses, who've been raised by their parents to think that this is acceptable and this is the ideal standard that they need to be reaching to, who will just be thinking, there's no end to this. There's no end. I thought that the paradise was supposed to perfect me. But apparently, when God brings people back into perfect bodies, the gayness will still be there. So how on earth can I achieve perfection? if God's going to be resurrecting people into perfect bodies where people are still gay. That's why this is, I think, the worst video that Watchtower put out in 2020 in a long line of terrible videos. And it's arguably one of the worst bits of rhetoric that the organisation has ever committed to camera. So expect to see this again. I, I'll have more to say about this in the future. And it's made even worse when we understand that Stephen Lett is perpetuating this hatred, even though he should know better because he lost his own nephew due to the effect that this kind of ideology, this toxic ideology has on people's mental health. So we made it the 10 worst videos of 2020. Let me know what you think in the comments. I realize there were many, many bad videos and I apologize if I've not included the video that you think was the worst or that you think should have been in the top 10 or the worst 10. Let me know in the comments what you think I should have included and then at least it gets an honorable mention when people scroll through the comments. But I hope you found this video interesting. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.